Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. If you uh, happen to come and with us on last Tuesday night when we began our, the gospel series, we're going through the gospel for four weeks and, and explaining it in, in detail and in a kind of a class setting, what is the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, then hopefully you began to recognize even from our readings today and some of the, the, how the combination of them, uh, some of what we said. And so if you weren't there, uh, or even if you were there, we'll just remind you, we, when, we look at, when we're looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the event uh, of the life of Christ, that good news event is preceded by uh, a backstory. And the backstory is full of promises that God was making to his people, really of healing uh, and salvation. And they, that all culminates <clears throat> into Jesus Christ. And some of the latest promises that God was giving in the backstory, uh, that's part of the story of the Israelites, was basically that he himself was going to come. He himself was going to come and save and rescue his people and bring salvation and, and even be enthroned among them as king. Uh, and those were some of the latest promises. And actually, that's one of the promises that we see in the first reading today in Isaiah. It's, one of, it's one of, just one of the passages that's part of that big backstory that culminates and leads up to the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so let me just, we just want to point some of these, these out again to show how these promises were fulfilled in the life of Christ. <clears throat> now, notice in the first reading, Isaiah says, say to, or God says through Isaiah, say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong. Fear not. Why? Here is your God. He comes with vindication, with divine recompense. He comes to save you. So that's important to, put, to point out. God himself is saying, he is coming. He is not sending a messenger. He is not sending a prophet. That he himself is going to come. How will we know when he comes? <clears throat> Well, here's some signs that he gives. Then, when your God comes, will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared, the lame will leap like a stag, the tongue of the mute will sing. That's how you know God's here. <laughs> and so, you have to... We have to just, you know, imagine or recognize this is the part of the backstory of the Israelites. So they were growing up, you know, with these promises. And most of us don't have any firsthand experience of this. But can you imagine, you know, growing up as a people or, you know, as a family, and there's promises that you were, you were told when you were a child and continue to be reminded, hey, God promised our family he was going to bless us with this. And it hasn't happened yet. It's been 600 years. But it could be this generation. And so stay alert, be watchful, and be aware. These are the things God promised to us. And he's faithful, so it could be your generation. And if it's not, you got to tell your children so they can watch. You see how they were holding on to these promises generation after generation as a people. And most of us have no idea what that's like. And so this, that's what I mean when I say this is their back story. This is the, their story, their family history. And so we fast, if you fast forward to the gospel, all of a sudden here we have the life event of Jesus Christ, the good news event of Christ. And this is how they were supposed to recognize God is here because the things he promised are happening in the life of Christ. And just our passage today gives us one of those examples uh, that fulfills two of the signs from that first reading where the deaf, a deaf man has been able to now to hear and he was mute, had a speech impediment, and now he speaks clearly. And that should be incredible. No, no wonder at the end of the gospel passage that says they're all exceedingly astonished uh, and they say, he has done all things well. He's done all things well. Now, 
if you were there on Tuesday, we also talked about how the good news event of Jesus Christ not only has a backstory but a future story, right? Jesus, it's not just good news for the lifetime of Jesus, but he had, there's, that opened up good news for the future because he promised that he was going to come again and complete definitively what he started. And then that, that good news in the future and the good news of the life of Christ changed the time now, the in-between time of the life of Christ and the future event when he comes again. Now is different because of what he did. Not only will he come again to complete what he finished, but while he's gone, he, he commanded his disciples to continue what he began. So it's a little side note to think about, but you know, if um, Jesus is gonna come back again and complete what he started, why does he need us to continue what he started? If he's just gonna finish it, right? There must be something in there for us to do that we have to complete before he comes back. Or, or he, maybe he ain't coming back until we do our part. And that's something we have to consider, you know, because we all have a part. We've been commanded. It was not a suggestion by Jesus. At the end of Matthew and at the end of Mark, we were joined to his mission to continue what he started, to do what he did. And that discipleship, he said, takes training. And when you're fully trained, he promised, you'll be just like the master. And so we all have to get to work in our training. You know, if we spend all of our time just watching Netflix series, then we'll be really good at watching Netflix series. <laughs> We're really good at whatever we put our time into. But if we, you know, begin to get, put our time into practicing what Jesus said, we'll be really good at doing what Jesus did. Recognizing that big picture and our part to play in between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ should make us as disciples hungry to learn and to train to do what Jesus did until we become just like the master. And that would mean you, you should be hungry to read the gospels and the life of Christ and say, well, how did you do what you did? For example, how did you heal? How did you lay hands on the sick so that they could be healed? And there's lessons we can learn. And we want to, I want to step through and point out four or five points in our healing today because it's a very good uh, story that could be used for really teaching probably four classes. And I'm just going to give you a little bit on each point so wherever you are, you can go deeper in those points and, and keep learning or keep practicing. First, we see that they bring a deaf man to Jesus who has a speech impediment. They say, beg him, lay your hands on him. Why? Because he had been laying hands on everybody before that. It said everybody who was sick, they brought to him. He laid his hands on them, and they all recovered. Every single one was healed. So they recognize a pattern. <laughs> Please, lay your hands on this one too. Jesus, instead, he, it says the first thing he does is he takes him off by himself away from the crowd. Get away from distractions. You ever try to pray in the marketplace? Pretty hard. Uh, that's, that would be good distraction training. <laughs> After you've learned how to pray in the quiet. <laughs> you know? And when you're alone with God in adoration and you can hear his voice and feel his presence and you got that down and you can ask God's questions and you recognize him when he's given you answers and responses and you can say, Show, tell me your heart for this person and give me your heart for that situation and what are your purposes here in, in this, this part of the world. And when you're hearing God's voice clearly and, and, and uh, consistently in the quiet, now go in the marketplace. Because that's really where God wants us. He, he wants us out there with the world, drawing them close to him. Jesus, even Jesus, gets away from the crowd. You can imagine, uh, if you've ever watched a, a priest after mass in the greeting line, 
I do the quotes because it's supposed to be a greeting line, but all kinds of stuff comes up in that greeting line <laughs> that are not greetings. <laughs> and it gets crazy. If you ever watch, if they ever gave me a seminarian to train, I'd say, just shadow me. You stand right here next to me, and you get exposed to everything I get exposed to, and let's see if you still want to do this. Because some people say hi and bye, and others say, can you bless me? And others say, well, Father, my so-and-so just died. I don't know what to do. And the next person says, I got cancer. Please pray for me right now. And there's 10 people still behind them that want to say hi. And then there's three children running up on the side because they want to give hugs to. And there's somebody who feels neglected behind them, and they're poking the priest or got to get his attention. There's no focus, right? And you have to imagine, if that, hap if that happens in a little greeting line after Mass, what was happening to Jesus, surrounded by crowds of thousands? <laughs> oh my gosh, Jesus. No wonder he, got, he said, let's go away from the crowd. <laughs> so I can focus on you and be present to you right in front of me. And sometimes that's the first thing we have to do when we're going to pray for somebody is to pause, center ourselves, get all the other thoughts and distractions and things going on for the day in our life out of our mind so we can just be present to the person in front of us. Even if they're not in front of us, if they just text you and said, I need prayers because this is going on, and you go sit quietly in your prayer chair, corner in your room, Somewhere where there's no distractions, the TV's not on, radio's not on, nobody's chiming in your ear. You can just focus on what needs to be prayed for. That's the first thing Jesus does. First lesson when we're going to pray for somebody. Don't do these drive-by prayers. Probably by faith something is happening, but probably not much. You do a little drive-by prayer. Oh, Lord, lift them up to you, Lord. Help them. Please help them. You know, because i got to go get breakfast right now. we got to pause. Busyness that distracts us and pulls our, the, the energy of our attention away is not from God. And if we're too busy to stop things and focus on, on a need that, for prayer, we're too busy. That's part of our main job as Christians. Pray. The second thing Jesus does is touch. Now, especially this especially applies for healing prayer. He didn't lay his hands on the, on the man. Instead, he takes his finger. Now, I want, you got, I want to get close reading. Slow this down so you realize how weird this is. Okay. He takes his finger and puts it into the man's ears. What do they call that, a wet willy or something like that? It kind of sounds like that's what he did to the man. Put it in his man's ears. Then he spits, and he touches the man's tongue. So he touched, so first he touched the places that need healing, the ears and the tongue, and then he spits. So next time you pray for somebody, <laughs> all right, just making sure you're awake. The, most, the first important part is the touch. Touch is so important, you know. If it's appropriate and you can lay your hands on the person, on their shoulder, on their head, on, on their arm, hold their hand while you're praying for them, the touch is so important. Why? Because when we are praying, this is, another, this is the difference between Old Testament and New Testament. When we are praying as New Testament people, we're not asking, begging God to shoot down healing from heaven like lightning bolt comes down from, heaven, from the sky. We're not saying, oh, God, please do something. Throw down some healing, you know, shower down some healing, please. Why are, we not, why are we not asking God to do something way over there, send something down? Because God's not over there. Where's God? Which means if the, what heals, when God heals, it's his life touching the person, and that's what heals the person. So if God's in here, where's his life coming from? Right here. It ain't coming from out there somewhere. Some out there, you know, in the cloud, like all of our email. It's coming from right here. This is where God is. So if he's going to heal this person in front of you, it's going to be his life coming out of you into the person. And touch is an easy connection for that to happen. Like I said, all these could be a 20-minute talk each. 
but we're just touching on, just, just say a few things to help you recognize when, you, as you're practicing praying for people. Now, why did he spit? I have no idea. And, and there's no good commentaries. There's a couple side uh, comments people make about, well, in the culture in that day, they believed saliva had healing properties, so that's why he spit. Well, Jesus never used healing properties of nature to heal. So that doesn't really line up with the, his life and the way that he healed. He healed by the Holy Spirit and by his, the command of his voice, his word. The spirit and his word, just like he created at the beginning of time. It was a spirit hovering over the waters and the word of God went out. So there's just no satisfying reason why he spit. If, we, if they give it to us in, a, in a, the next chapter, he heals a man's eyes by spitting in his face. I don't know, weird, huh? He spits three times. Three healings and spitting involved. I don't know why. It's just good to recognize sometimes things are weird. Right? Sometimes, if it works, I don't know. But it's just good to recognize that sometimes things are weird. They're not all super clean. Oh, see, he just put his hands on them and said a couple cute words and made everybody feel nice and then he got healed. No, he did weird stuff. He gave people wet willies, and he spits all over the place, and we don't know, and, you know, the next thing he does here is he groans. You know? He groans. This would be, if, if you've done any uh, training or study in healing, this would be what I would call he releases the spirit. The spirit of God's inside him, and the groaning releases the spirit out. Because what happens immediately afterwards is the words. Remember, again, I told you, this is the connection from, of creation. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and then the Word of God went out. And then that's when things started happening. Let there be light, light. Why? Because you have Spirit and Word. So he groans, and the groaning releases the Spirit. And, and the most common way we see Jesus release the Holy Spirit when he's going to heal somebody is it most commonly says he was moved with compassion. And in the Greek, the, the description of the, that movement of compassion is from, from the depths of his being coming out. It's, it's a good reminder for us that if we're going to pray for somebody and we want the results of Jesus, we have to be moved with the compassion of Jesus for that person. We should see their situation. It should make us groan. You know, Jesus groans over the effects of sin, sickness, disease, decay, deformity, death. Jesus, God groans over those things in our life. You know, when we groan, it's because something has upset us, you know? Or, you know, you say, oh, this is happening again? This guy is still preaching? Oh, right? <laughs> I mean, you just groan from inside you. There's no other words. You're just, so you just groan. I connect this to the Holy Spirit because Paul taught that the Holy Spirit inside of us prays inside of us and with groanings that words cannot express. And so when Jesus is groaning, it's the Holy Spirit praying with inexpressible words. And then as he's releasing the spirit inside him to this man, then he speaks. Be opened. How do you know what to say when you're praying? The most simple thing to, pr to say when you and I are praying for people is speak the end result. Speak the result you want. He wants a man's ears open? Be opened. <laughs> When, if you had no idea what to say, just say, be healed. <laughs> be healed. If they're upset, be at peace or peace be with you. You know, you speak the result you want to happen in the person's life. It, as we practice and put all these things together, we have to imagine if we're doing, if we're doing this like Jesus, we'll get the results like Jesus. Okay, it's kind of mechanical, but at the same time, there's parts for each of us to play. We have to focus. 
Uh, another place here, he says, he put his eyes on heaven. We, when we're praying for people, don't look at the sickness, look at Jesus. Because he's the one inside of us continuing his mission. This is not what I'm doing with my own power. I'm just simply trying to get focused, um, put my touch, make a connection, release the spirit of Jesus that's inside me so that the words of Jesus can heal the person. It's Jesus, Christ in you. Christ in me. The greatest mystery, Paul says. He is the one continuing his ministry between his first coming and his second coming. The best way to practice this, I encourage people, if you're not sure, you're insecure, you're like me, very shy, practice at home, in your room, when nobody is looking. You can first practice with yourself, if you need any healing in your own body, or every one of us knows people who need healing in their life. They need something. Whether they need peace, whether they need healing in relationships, or they need physical healing, because a lot of people do have cancer today. A lot of people have a lot of different things, uh, side effects, illnesses going on. A lot of people need healing. If you have nobody, send me an email and I'll send you 10 people. And you can just practice in your room alone when nobody's looking and, and you just imagine they're right in front of you. And you can pray this way. And if you're sincere and actually praying, even though you're practicing, it's a real prayer and they could actually be healed from a distance. Jesus healed from a distance. And when we pray, wherever we are, it, uh, it matters and it affects the world. Which one of these areas will you practice today? If anything, I would, the biggest ones, I would, well, they're all important. Focus, groan over the effects of sin. Let, God, let God's compassion move you and then speak the results and result you want to happen in somebody's life. When you can do that instinctually, now you're like Jesus.